Yo, welcome to yeah. welcome to Red River, man. Uh, I get to be on the phone today with uh, Mr. TJ Penzone, man. What's up? How you doing, man? Good. Um, I I got to say hello in the Jeff the Drunk way, which is cello. Mm -hmm. Cello. Which is uh something that we we bonded over, which was uh, Howard Stern. How did you get into Stern? Um. I mean, you know, I listened to him when I was younger and was a fan, but I kind of like never was, li never listened to it a bunch. And then I, at some point I like had a car and it came with it on the, the Sirius, came with Sirius. And I was like hooked in like two days, pretty much. I'm driving around. Yeah, it's like, uh, <clears throat> like when I was younger, I would watch the Channel 9 show. Like I wouldn't watch, I wouldn't listen to the radio. Um, because like, who the fuck is waking up in the morning as, you know, as a kid, like I was like 10, I wasn't, I didn't get it, but like I would watch Saturday, he would have a channel line show and, uh, he would do the craziest fucking shit. And I think a lot of that stuff between him and David Letterman, I think a lot of that stuff really formed my, uh, my humor and, uh, where it all came <laughs> from, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And also, I think we have a lot in common of just maybe from being Long Island and being neurotic, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a it's he's obviously a Long Island staple and stuff, and I, and and really what I love about it, it it's like no different than like uh, he's like you know like a favorite band. You know, once you find out someone's a Stern fan, you know, you basically talk to them about the history and the show, <clears throat> and it just like connects you, and uh, it's cool. You know, it's like that. Uh, you know. It's like people no. liking the same Metallic album. Yes, which would be Load or Reload. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hanging up. Which, one? which one's yours? I'm hanging up right now. Uh, no, it's true. I have like multiple friendships that are very based off of that, off of Stern. It's yeah. pretty funny. It's it's just you know it's it's a big thing, and uh, obviously Load or Load or Reload not so much. And just, <laughs> everyone knows Injustice for All is the best one. So. I hate to say it though, but in context, the stuff they did after that, those albums aren't that bad. I don't think they were that bad. <laughs> no, I don't. I just me, me and my brother have a like he has a really weird obsession. I I get like five to ten Metallica videos a day from him of just them in the studio acting like cranky, out of touch dudes. Oh well, th they've been <laughs> so out of touch that it's ridiculous. <laughs> like I think I think if you're that big. You know, you start out as this, like, hungry metal band, and, you know, it's like 1982, and you're sleeping on floors, uh, and, you know, from there, their their trajectory has been nothing but nonstop until, like, the Napster thing, you know? Um, yeah. And then from there, people just, like, fucking roasted them, and the fact that they were still making, like, these records that weren't, like, appealing to the older fan base, and, and that's fine. But, uh, you know, Death Magnetic and Hardwire, I thought they, they came back and, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, you're still 30, 35 years older start playing in a band. Like, you're not going to, yeah. maybe you're not going to want to play that same shit, you know? No, but we, we were talking about it, my, my brother and we were like, they're still like, they never were like a, even a centimeter smaller. <laughs> Like nah. everything they've ever they've, like that was the thing that's funny though. It's like no matter what they do, they're the biggest metal band ever. You know what I mean? And and when you really break it down, just the aggression, like it's they're like the most famous aggressive band. Yeah, you know it's not. <laughs> but, they, but, but then we start like trying to get into like the psychology of it and be like, but like why didn't they instead of going to Bob Rock? Like why didn't they just get this like? sick hip metal producer and then i when we stopped this i was like why are we talking about they're the richest biggest metal band. like who cares what we think I, you know what i mean like but we get obsessed like it's no so funny. it's 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 a good question like you hear the production on saint anger and it's like who okayed that like where was like the the meeting that they were like this sounds like a fucking garbage can being hit perfect you know there was a snare drum meeting there was an absolute meeting specifically for the snare drum set it's like bing 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 and like he's like yeah perfect <laughs> and kirk you can't do solos like i just it was like so weird you know but like it's it's one yeah. of those things where bands if they're if they're around <clears throat> long enough they'll conform to like whatever it is like slayer did it with some records um some bands are just like okay well let me change the sound up a little bit and it just never fucking works 
Yeah. Slayer, were they just going to go, they went like new metal for a minute? I, I wouldn't say new metal, but they just kind of like were, were being influenced by the bands that they influenced. So yeah. they, they would tour with like Hate Breed. And then they, they put out, you know, Diabolos and Musica and, um, fuck, I forgot the one after. Might have been, yeah, it might have been God Hates Us All. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, like you start to sound just different. And then they went back to like the speed metal thing. But, yo, know, it's yeah. tough, man. You're in a band and, and you get it because, like, you want to evolve the sound. But from like men, women, women, and children, which was like the band that you you start you you were in before these people, like it's so different from what you do. Yeah, that specifically was because that, like, what I do now is like my are like my songs, like fully, you know. Okay. Um, whereas that was like four people in a room, you know, trying to achieve something specific. You know what I mean? Even though like my brother still plays with me on my stuff and and co-producers with me and stuff but yeah that was like totally like we were like try we were trying to achieve something specific you know what i mean whereas how did that band come together like men women and children like you guys got sound signed to fucking warner brothers like how, how did that come together that was because well that was because of glass Straw, because todd was in glass Straw. um and he was just like my my buddy you know, like I was friends. My first tour ever was guitar attacking for him for uh, on the Glass Show tour. It was the first time I ever like went in a band with anyone, and so we were we've been we were close for a while. And yeah, he was like starting some band and just the music, like he had just had some music. You know, there were no vocals, and he just so I just had it because it was his. You know, and I was just driving around and I started making melodies to and and. So I just said, you know, you can have it just have these melodies. I was doing another band. I had no interest in, you know, being in the band because I just thought it was a little thing he was doing, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I just gave him the melodies, which was what became like the single of the tune. And then whatever happened, but he asked me to be in the band. So, but I had no intention of that. It was really very much so like, hey, I had some ideas. I know what you're going for. This like, you know the aesthetic i knew what he was trying to do and i kind of wrote for that were you always good so, at songwriting was always good at songwriting <laughs> no. uh, yeah i'm just saying like were you no. like, listen were i'll you, tell you no I, definitely not <laughs> well then how did how did you hone into that because like the, the the last these people singles are fucking great like the melodies are Thank just you. they're not like run of the mill like i write like very basic pop music you know like i write like three chord stuff um, what you're doing is a little bit more out there uh, as far as the production as well, for sure. So how did you how did you go from from that band to what you do now? Well, I think it was definitely like kind of an accident. I think my earlier things, you know, I was in, I think I did almost every style when I was a child, you know, Dis like disco? just no. Well, that I know, that's what I did. <laughs> um, it, it was like I was just always trying to. I was just like interested in music, you know what I mean? And I was always like just starting different bands and trying different stuff. It'd be heavier than there'd be like, uh, I was into like Sunny Day Real Estate and it'd be a band in that vein. And and then when I, I think the thing with the men, women, and children thing is that I think it took me out of like, how do I say this? Like it just took me out of genre, I think. Okay. Like of regarding, because even though that band is is a, in, in a genre, it was like we listened to so many different things, I think. And then after we got signed and after I was touring, I remember like just listening to so much stuff that when I went to go write my own songs, like something just kind of came out because I actually did, we, we toured for a few years and I wasn't writing really, you know, aside from writing vocals for, for men, women, children, I wasn't writing, like really writing songs by myself anymore. You know what I mean? So then when I went to do that, that's kind of the sound kind of came out of these people, which was really based off stuff that I was really, yeah at the genesis of like getting into music, what I was into, like, you know, Sid Barrett and yeah, I don't know. Like, Not, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Like you could hear a lot of that early influence, you know, from, from him, from Sid Barrett. Uh, and I'm not too familiar with a lot of the early Pink Floyd stuff, but like the stuff that I know, like, I'm like, okay, yeah, like I could totally hear that. Uh, and that other band that you, you love, you know, you mentioned the band can, which I've, I've never even heard of until you mentioned it. Yeah, so I think it was also it was based off a lot of the stuff that I really loved when I was younger, and then what I was getting into as I was really just like searching for more and more music, and I was really stopped listening to like my friends' bands. In you know, obviously, you know, we know a few people. <laughs> we know a few people that 
have played in professional bands. And, sure, sure. You know, when you're hanging out and you're younger, you're all listening to each other stuff. And I think when I stopped doing that, it made me really delve more into deeper things that I was interested in. And it kind of made me not pay attention to what was happening, I think. So then when I went to go make my own music, something just kind of came out. You know, I was, I know I was definitely when I was, um, when I was writing, when I started writing the tunes, I was like really into like early T-Rex. Like when, they, before they were like rock and roll, like more like, you know, dude on bongos and just acoustic like mystical kind of stuff and i think i was obsessed with to a level where even, even on the first tune on the first these people thing you can hear that element i think but uh, so that's that's funny like you went that far back it's almost like this this thing that you were railing against like you know whatever the stuff we were coming up with you know like you were just like i'm gonna try yeah. just try something different um, I just had no interest in it. I no just didn't. It was everyone was, do, you know what I mean? Like it just, and not, you know, nothing bad against anyone. I just didn't, that's not the kind of what I wanted to write. And I think like, I always think it's, you know, interesting when someone had does something and it sounds like that. I mean, I feel like these people, you know, everyone thinks that about their own music, so it sounds stupid, but I, I think these people to me sound like movies I like in soundtracks and, 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 you know, musicians and all mixed together with, me kind of just doing what comes natural. Like even the vocals are very different than men, women, and children. I sang in like on the top of my register and, and the bottom on like every song, you know, whereas these people, I like, wanted something more calming because I have to listen to it a million times while I'm mixing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's very airy and it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. There's no, it's almost like a piece of paper floating in the air, you know, like you don't know where it's going to go. Like it's not like a formula that you're following. No, it's just like when I go to when I go to sing now, it's just like that. Or for obviously the last while of being in the band, it's just it's like just as it's like it's like comfortable for me, and it's it's like relaxing almost instead of like trying to you know just like trying to outdo myself on every tune and go as do something that I, you know it's out of my even league singing. You know what I mean? I I, I, I get think. that. I get that too because like uh, when I was younger, I would write stuff that was even at the top of my register. And as I got older, I'm, I started playing around with tunings and I'm thinking like, why don't I just change the key? Like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You know, but... like, I don't get it. Like the melody is going to stay the same. Just change the key because it's not like, you know, I'm not fucking Freddie Mercury and I don't, <laughs> I don't pretend to be. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I think about it just, I think I, what I is like, I feel like I just found my process. You know what I mean? Like, because I do have different kinds of tunes. Like, even the last one we put out, the, you know, there's like two newest singles. Like, the first one is definitely more upbeat um, and no acoustics whatsoever. It's actually in the bridge, there's acoustic. But a lot of my stuff does have that underlying acoustic thing because sometimes it's written that way. You know what I mean? So, like, I just I'll write acoustic to a to a click track and then build the song around it, and I usually end up keeping it because I don't know it just worked in there. You know. Now you, you said that you were like influenced by like movie soundtracks. Like, w what are some ones that stick out that you feel like that really hit you as a kid? I, oh, uh, well, I don't want to get into the movies things. I know I had to pick five of my favorite. No, movies, no, yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter. A lot of John Carpenter stuff. I always found that really fascinating. You know? Yeah, yeah. That's um, he's he's. It's amazing because like you know, uh, you know, through the years of watching him do interviews, and he just basically said it was like a DIY thing. You know, he just said that. Uh, his you know like let's say halloween just didn't have a budget so he's like fuck it i just have to come yeah. up with something myself and then i remember they 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 premiered the movie without the score and it didn't it didn't test well and then after that he was just like okay let me figure something out and then and then they had that score which is like iconic you know oh, so yeah. fucking iconic for that halloween movie and it was just because he said okay we don't have a budget, so I'm just going to take yeah. a synthesizer and I'm going to fucking create this score. And it's like, wow, from there to the fog, like it just, yeah. this guy is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, a genius. Did you catch him when he was doing the shows? No, I did not actually. And I, I did want to, it's one of those things like, I don't even really go to a lot of concerts that often, I think. And it's one you're, of those things too like, cool, too cool for concerts. No, no, <laughs> I just, it's just like anxiety of going out and being around, being around human you never, beings. You never heard of drugs? Uh, not anymore. Oh, okay. I was going to say. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, listen, I do go occasionally to stuff, but there's a lot of stuff where I'm like, I really want to see that. And then, you know, I it just, doesn't, I, I don't know. My, some of my friends went, I, I didn't actually get a chance to go. And, uh, so it was like him and his son and his nephew, I believe. 
and they're performing the scores for these movies with the scenes in the background, which uh, yeah, that's so cool. My friend Mike, that's awesome. My friend Mike, who went, he, you know, we love movies, man, and he was like, "Yo, he's like, I swear to God, I cried." <laughs> <laughs> he's like I just fucking cried. He's like, here is John Carpenter fucking playing these songs that we all. Uh, I would have, I, yeah, yeah, that we all. Grew and up on. I would, I, if I could turn back time, I would have absolutely went to that for sure. So getting into Za, which I think comes from the ending of Men, Women, and Children, I, I believe we had that discussion. So how do you, how'd you guys get signed to to Warner Brothers, and how did it all just come to an end? Um, well, um, like I was mentioning, I guess I uh, kind of went away from that, but Todd had a deal because of Glassjaw. And then after I sang on the demos and my brother joined the band, um, we got signed off like just like three tunes or something like that because he was already locked into Warner Brothers. So we sent in the demos and they pretty much were interested in signing us right away. And we didn't actually want to sign with them, actually. Why? And we we had we had a really great manager named Tom Gates at the time. He managed brand new and uh, the format. Okay. Um, and he we had other offers actually, which is pretty funny because like for thinking about a bands now, you get you make a demo and you that doesn't really happen that much anymore. Ever as much I would say. <laughs> um, and so it was really crazy, and we didn't even want to sign with Warner Brothers, and we kind of like were forced to. I mean, now they look at it too. Like, if I could turn back time, it was a good deal. Like, they didn't own a lot of our stuff, and we kept our merch and all that kind of stuff, and tour support we got, and equipment budgets. It was very surreal. Um, that's how we got signed because of that, because he was already connected, and we were just like, it's the easiest thing for us to do than us trying to sign with another label while he's on Warner Brothers, and then they put the album in limbo, and you know what I mean. So yeah, for sure. And and I think, you know, w w the benefit of something like that, especially for a touring market, um, maybe back then it wasn't as much as, as it is now. But like, you know, to just have that tour support, you know, that that had to be like the, the 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 best part of it. It was pretty awesome. I think at the time we're like, oh, this is what's supposed to happen. But now it's like, oh, my goodness. You know, imagine someone's like, oh, hey, uh, Sam, here's this much money going on tour and stay in hotels. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Definitely, it definitely was. Um, I'm very appreciative that we kind of had that opportunity, get to go to Europe a bunch of times, and that was, you know, pretty yeah, crazy. On, you know? on music for sure. And and at the, any point in this time, did you think like this is it? Like we're we're gonna hit, and this is gonna be the rest of my life? Um, I think so because of the way that everything was happening. We just kind of assumed we were we were getting had no problem getting on tours. We because of our we you know because of our friends, and then on top of we had a really amazing booking agent. And so like, that was like our first, we had, we did like one little tour, like nightmare of you, which was like, obviously like a friend's tour. And then we like went right on tour with gang of four, for like a full U S tour, which was like heavy. We were heavy and very honored to be able to do that. And they were so kind to us and got to play on stage with them. And, uh, we did like a funkadelic song. Like they saw us as he's like, I, I it was really, really funny. It was like their idea. And by the way, rest in peace, Andy Gill from gang of four, who just died recently. Yeah. Uh, he was, a. Uh, I really love that dude. He was very kind to me even after that for a bit, we stayed in touch, but, um, yeah, we got to do a lot of stuff. We go, you know, we, we just some really cool tours and even just getting to go to Europe, you know, was really, yeah, really fun with, and with, interesting. Like you said, gang of four, like, I feel like a, a, a group that might, might've been like the forefathers of what, what I think you guys were going for. Is that Jimmy, definitely the guitar, definitely the guitar vibe yeah. i think you know yeah, the guitar vibe for sure i mean obviously yeah. you guys were a little bit you know more dancey and poppy but like just that that guitar and that feel was so left field you know yeah they said like we reminded them of, like funkadelic because just how we were just like crazy on stage and and uh and the whole vibe of it which was like and that's why we, we did like flashlight funkadelic on stage with them every night it was, I, like, thought, I thought it was because you, you wore a diaper and uh had cowboy boots it's because of the well. That was no. It wasn't because <laughs> they didn't know about that. <laughs> that was only in the van. That was only in the van for long drives. So, um, but ahead. anyway, yeah. But yeah, look, no, um, no. so so going on. Um, I I, I remember. Oh, so how did it end? You wanted to, like how did it? How did it end? end? Because I feel like you you from there it goes to like the za the pizza. You know, uh, it's not it's not even directly. But it's a little bit after that. But basically, what happened was is we just couldn't get along at all. I think like and I love all these guys now. We actually stay in touch for the most part, all of us and. Um, you know, uh, but we, how do I say this? Um, we just really couldn't get along. I think there was just too many strong personalities in it. And 
Yeah. Like uh, our Scully, our drummer was like the only like calm, like in the middle, like he must've felt like he was in like a mental traveling mental hospital. You know what I mean? <laughs> but he was like the calm one that was just like, dude, like, this is great. Like what? And we were just like throwing chairs at each other and like, like, you know, acting crazy. We just were being so crazy. So a lot of times it was funny though. You know what I mean? It wasn't all like, you know, but we just really couldn't get along. And then we actually were on this MTV two tour they would head on Amatica and uh, Jared Leto's band. I think it was just like mo- we, uh, seconds from Mars or some shit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, 30 seconds from Mars. Um, and uh, and yeah, we got our van and trailer stolen in Detroit. We parked in this like shade, we the shady hotel and we left it there and we woke up the next day and it was just all gone. There was like workers like he was working, um, you know, doing construction. They might who know who knows. They, they, Listen, that they might have called their friends and were like, yo, there's a van here. Who, I mean, I don't know who did it. But. That is the biggest. Anytime I see that, even now, like, you know, with when those things happen, like, what is the feeling like when you see when you realize that all your shit is stolen? It is the worst. Well, definitely one of the worst feelings ever. Yeah, yeah I can't. I, it, it affects me even when I read that it happened to someone. It was, uh, a <clears throat> that, I mean, essentially that really, I, I think in my opinion, anyone could have a different opinion, but I think that's what really ended our band. I mean, we were, it was already like, we were like bummed, like the label gave us like a, so, we opted, the manager opted for like a soft release, which was like, when you do that, you're taking a big chance. Like we should have just been like, go for it. And we could have caught on something. You what, know what, what I'm saying? That? Like, I, I don't, I have heard of soft release. At the t- I just don't know what it is. Uh, it's like, it's like being like, instead of them putting a half a million dollars into, or whatever they would put into radio and all this stuff so that your just stuff goes everywhere and might hit it's like they they do they don't do that <laughs> i guess they just get it in some stores and put it out to some stuff and not really put money into it and then if all of a sudden it's like you know looks like people really care then all of a sudden they step in and it was that was i mean that was also i had kind of had a falling out with the manager at that time too which i called him years later and apologized to him because i i kind of felt bad like him deal he'd be getting ims remember ims by the way yeah, yeah. You'd be getting like from all of us having what? to say the same thing. Like, we tortured that dude, you know? What, what was your name? Oh, Tigersaurus Rex with uh, a Y. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, so, so basically, I think, yeah, after that, after that, the soft release thing happened, and then we lost our van and trailer uh, with like a, over $100,000 worth of gear. Jesus. Like, we did, dudes brought like real keyboards on tour. Like, I don't know why anyone would do that uh, oh. at that, at that level of a band. And we lost all this stuff. Our, everyone's clothes. I, it was, I feel bad, but I feel like I was the only, I just had all my, I was like so OCD with like being in the van. Like I still rip the, the, the wrappers off my water because I don't want because I want to know which water is mine, wh- wherever I am. You know what <laughs> I mean? So I, I, you'd see me and I'd have like in the van and I have like, like literally like, uh, like dog slippers or like something stupid in the corner with my water and my computer. And it was all like very neat and, and stuff like that. So I had all that stuff with me when that stuff happened for the most part. I think I lost like one guitar. Uh, yeah. So no, but anyway, that was the only thing I really lost and everyone else lost a lot of stuff. And it was really like a, a very big bummer. You know what I mean? We were just like, what, what do we do? You know what I mean? And we, and instead of dropping off the tour, we just went like back. We just like, when well, we stay on the tour with like, we, I think we jumped on like the Cobra starships, half of us were on their bus and their half were on like, had on a Matica's bus, and yeah, it was like, it, so it was just, Cobra Stars. so we finished the tour, but we didn't have any clothes, no one had really clothes, I'm, or I'm gonna stop, anything. I'm going to stop you, Cobra Starship. Remember yeah. remember Benji's girlfriend said she played for them? Dude, oh, yeah, I can't even go to, off off record, I'll tell you something funnier. <laughs> but, what was but her yeah, name? She, I forgot. Uh, Elisa? Elisa. She was the keyboardist of Cobra Starship. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Elisa. <laughs> uh yes that that is was very full circle too actually with the howard stern stuff when when that happened i found that to be really crazy that you know is, what i mean that but because she's got a little fame from that but yeah she was like the keyboard player and uh she was she was wild but anyway so that's i think that's what really anyway when when all that happened so we stay on that tour man we just we used everyone's equipment and we just finished the tour out and but by the end of that it, it like we were just in so much debt that we had to keep touring to even just get out of debt we lost all our t-shirts and equipment and so like the last show we did like we headlined like gramercy ballroom in the city and we literally got out of debt like that night so like we were doing great and then we just kind of got screwed and then that was just like everyone was 
wanted to just do different stuff. You know. What about? So I'm going to ask you one last question on them. Yeah. What What is like the one big regret that you have about that band that you wish you could take? I don't know. It's I I, I battle with it. Some like of just like randomly it'll pop into my head and I'll be like, oh, it would have been cool if we just like kept putting out records because we had like a whole other album that we didn't finish. You know what I mean? That we were recording and and we were getting it was getting pretty far out. I don't know. Like I was just like, oh, we could have just kept putting out records even if we weren't touring or if it wasn't all of us. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. but um, but then you know. I really feel though, like, you know, it was, it wasn't supposed to happen. So it's not like something I, you know, ever think about. Yeah. So I, yeah, it's very rare. It's like, just rare. I'm like, I'll be like, Oh, you know, that would have been fun mostly because I just would have liked to keep evolving. And like, instead of it being like one record and now we would have had more stuff that we were, you know, we were really excited about some of the other stuff we were doing. And then we just kind of like, all right, like, yeah, you know, cause but, what, but I'll tell what, you though, it's what happens. For, you know, there's everything happens for a reason. I didn't definitely would not have, probably went as deep into doing my own stuff oh wow know? interesting oh i don't know i mean i don't know it's different you know uh, everyone went and did other things so so how, how does that lead to your your business you you come home oh. you, you told me that you were looking at a way to basically um i guess maybe venture out <clears> for the <throat> music thing to have something a little bit more concrete uh and then you know yeah. See, i don't know i think i was i, uh, I think i was yeah, I think I was just kind of like, well, I know I remember though I was getting into like producing, like just like my friends' stuff and just to make some money, and I was like taught myself, you know, Pro Tools, and I was getting really into that and like recording techniques and all the stuff I learned from with working with other producers. So I was doing that stuff, and and then I I did start these people at that time, and we did do a tour opening for Glassjaw. We did like a full U.S. tour with them, and then after that tour, right before I even left for the tour, I kind of had the idea to do this late night pizza thing and so when i got right when i got home from it is when i started it so hmm. yeah i mean it's pretty much yes i probably i think i just had the idea i don't know i was just like i was going to a lot of spots in the city that had you, you were like i'm italian from long island let me open a i'm week. like where am i supposed to do what else am i supposed to do yeah that's it it was either join the mob or that yeah so i went with that <laughs> um yeah no so it was just kind of one of those things and then i was able to facilitate it because my friend of mine had a pizza place and i was like what if i come in there and do late night pizza when you close and he you'd be my partner and we'll do it and you know i do graphic design and stuff and i made like a menu and i'd go all the bars and i don't know what possessed me to do it to be honest with you <laughs> I really... I, it worked out great you know people know it and i it, it worked out because uh you're, you're next door to uh the leaky lifeboat i'm sure there, there's a lot of people that just venture from there and and also the late night thing the late night thing is such a big thing, you know. You get like the little Vincents of the world that are open at like two or three in the morning, where some yeah. people don't want fucking McDonald's or White Castle or Seven Eleven. They're like, you know what? Two slices of pizza right now at two in the morning sound fucking great. And I, I, I think a lot of it too. I, I, I'm now that I think about it, it, was out of convenience. I think I was, I was always up late. Like you know, I'd be recording till like five or six in the morning sometimes. Like I just wouldn't, especially in the winter hours. My hours were always flipped. You know. So I think, like, I was like, there's nothing to eat. Yeah. No, you're that's, right. I, I think the, it, this has to be at least the kind of the thing. That there's, other than Taco Bell, I'm not close at a certain time, and it isn't delivered to you, you know? No, yeah. So I don't, I'm sure that had something. I mean, they usually do stuff for convenience, I think. I probably was like, it's easier if I start my own thing than so wait in, for people to start doing it. In a time of COVID, uh, how has uh, yeah. the business been? Yeah, I mean, it's a delivery business, so it's it's been good. You know, and people love pizza and people love pizza. I've also took this time to, you know, really revamp the place a lot. You know what I mean? Like, um, shout out to Cameron a lot. and James Morano, right? Yes. Shout out to James Morano. Um, uh, Morano. I called him Jimmy though. I asked him say, as soon as I called him, the like, first thing I said, can I call you Jimmy? And he goes, I guess. I and guess. That was it. And then we went out and then we went with our, with our conversation. Um, he's, a, he's, uh, I have to shout him out because I think he's brilliant. I've, I'm also laughing because I've never even done professional like photo photos for the thing, you know. I never really even thought about it that much. It sounds far out, but he he is like so gifted at that stuff, you know. He's very that, good. Like I met him once. He's friends with my friend Andrew, and uh, you know, I I just saw his work and and the videos he was doing and like the 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 fucking uh, stuff that he puts up on Instagram. And I'm like, some some people just stick out, and he's one of those people whose work sticks out to me. I don't know. I just, you know, it's, it's, I think, 
I've been saying this lately, but it's like people can have good composition with photos, I think, but to make you want to eat the thing. Oh yeah, for sure. Is definitely, I found that I was having a problem finding a photographer personally. I mean, I could just my opinion, but obviously there's a lot of talented people, but I saw, I talked to him on the phone, cold called him because of a, some, a friend of mine mentioned him and I, we were just on the phone for like two hours talking about Howard Stern and video games and movies it was like really funny like we hung up the phone like this is like my best friend yeah <laughs> you know i mean you know i barely know him still but i'm kidding no we, we hung out last night he was he did some photos for me for these people and he's uh he's just so talented i just like really i like look at him and i'm like what a gifted dude you know does and, does he kiss with a closed mouth or open mouth? no it's open mouth and you know <laughs> you brought him up why you gotta do this you get me on a tangent with this dude. no i just love him i think he's really gifted and i think i'm, I'm yeah we're gonna like do a bunch of stuff together like all different stuff you well know? so so that brings us to these people you put out two singles recently and we had this discussion how releasing singles seems to be the best way to go um so you got a guy like james how long before he makes the video for this last song oh i we, we were talking about well, actually me and my other james who's who I love, and James yeah, Usher. James Usher. Which I will shout him out. I love him. He's another dude. I'm just talking. I, I get on the phone with him, and then like two hours later. Yeah, he's a great guy. Super um, talented. Yeah, he's a brilliant, brilliant dude. Um, and uh, no, it, me and him were talking yesterday, I think, and we were like, you know, obviously everything with everything going on, it doesn't sound as convenient to get our whole band together, oh, you know, the yeah, live band. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And so we were like, what if we do mind reading to like me and him? And we just shoot it like, like make the drums into like, you know, whatever drum machine or some other stuff and just do it like that. And I was talking to James about it and yeah, I don't know. So we were, we're, we're planning something like that. It's, you know, even the, like how it's going to look, but it'll be live. I think it's not going to be like a, like a video, like synced up or anything like that, you know? Okay. So what's that's the- probably that. Yeah. And then James has some other video that um, my friend Anthony shot of me doing like the first song on animal behavior. That's the EP that came out in the last year, like that, which is a lot of production and a lot of electronics. And that was, it's just acoustic and me, you know what I mean? So he's, he's messing with that. If you know, I, I shoot a lot of stuff all the time because I had a video and do stuff and it's like, but so much stuff doesn't come out. I just, if I don't feel like it's, you know, worth releasing, I won't put it out, you know? I just, so I, I just, I have no quality control. I just put it out. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, what's up with that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, um, yeah, okay. So I'm going to put that new song at the end of this episode just so people could listen to it. Awesome. Um, Thank you. And then from there, like I asked you, you know, I said, give me, I, I wanted you to, you know, to, to give me five movies that have stuck with you your whole life um, because I think that's a fun conversation and, and I'm really interested. I might, I might throw in a couple here and there myself. Um, Good. So give me your number five. <clears throat> my number five because it's yeah it's funny i mean <laughs> all right hold on, i was like i actually i didn't write it down i texted it to my friend so i'm looking through my text to find it i know what the number five is um well, it doesn't even have know. to be in order in order oh i because I, I thought the order of it yeah, made me laugh it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be in order you know you, you just need five, like two, two, five specific two, movies 2001 space odyssey i think is one of the most stunning cinematic things ever i think i've always i could just watch that calming in the back you know what i mean are you a big kubrick guy yeah he's amazing i don't know i love him he's okay he could be better <laughs> is yeah that, is that your favorite kubrick film um it's just the most it's, the, it's one of my favorite personal movies i think i just have like there, i do realize there's a theme like when i get stuck on something that throughout my whole life i stay with it so i i just i wouldn't not particularly like my favorite movie of his but my one of my favorite movies, you okay. know? Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll throw it? one in a Kubrick film okay. that I just recently rewatched again because Karen never saw it, which is a Full Metal Jacket. Oh, um, that must have been calming. Ha. Well, she was like, oh, I never saw this one. I was like, you never saw this one? <laughs> it was just like <laughs> perfect. And she was not into it. Like, I guess she just saw the name. She's like, I always wanted to watch this. But she couldn't really get past like the the beginning so she's like does this drill sergeant yell the whole movie i'm like well <laughs> i mean i don't know it's a fucking movie about vietnam and like marines and shit. it doesn't get happier I don't think. yeah it doesn't get happier but i mean just 
um, when you watch it, man, it's so it's so cold. You know, like you're yeah. there and this guy, brutal. The beginning is them getting these haircuts and the music's happy and, and it's just funny. But then, man, when it goes to, to, to that... Uh, spoiler alert. Oh, yeah, spoiler alert. They, they get haircuts in the in the beginning. Um, <laughs> it's just, man, it turns so cold and you're almost strapped in for this fucking long-ass ride. And uh, yeah. Matthew Modine, I, I mean, wow, Vincent D'Onofrio, just a really, really brutal Kubrick movie. So, yeah. What uh, uh, what else you got? Okay. All right. Uh, Blade Runner. That's just something that I've always loved. And that's another like aesthetic thing. It's just so beautiful, that movie. Aesthetic, you know what I mean? Aesthetic, for sure. The, the lighting. And um, I even watched that. I remember uh, like there's, it came with like a six disc thing of like the making of it <laughs> that was the craziest like it was it was like if you know the beginning where it like goes over like the city yep and it's just showing all this it, it, did you know that those are like, pla- like star- they did on the set of like where star wars was and it was like planes like from star wars like stuck to make to look like buildings some yeah. of that stuff I yeah that's, I, that, I found that fascinating but yeah so that's one that is a we, iconic for me one of my favorites yeah we just mentioned that i had uh frank antonetti on and we were talking about um our five favorite movie openings, and he picked Blade Runner, uh, basically the beginning of Blade Runner, how much he loved it. I remember having that on VHS, man, back when VHS, remember when VHS movies were like 100 bucks? <laughs> no, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah. I, I see a theme here. You have 2001. I know, I'm getting a little, a little sci-fi, but um, Ace Ventura 2, When Nature Calls. All right, left field, there you go. No, 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 I have to say something. That's actually tied. I have to say, I have to say the Truman Show. Um, I would say, but Ace Ventura Two: When Nature Calls is a movie that I could watch and laugh at and know every single line from. I think it hit me when I was a child. I mean, have you seen that movie? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, when he comes out of the rhino of rhinoceros. <laughs> See, I'm just thinking about it now. It makes me laugh. It's, um, yeah, it's 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 hilarious. I mean, just the theme of, of what it is, a pet detective. I mean, that's just fucking ridiculous, <laughs> you know? Did you see that thing on Stern where it was, like, it was David Allen Greer being like, you went to the movie, uh, the preview with uh, sitting next to Jim Carrey. And he's watching. And he's like, make, make him believe he's laughing the whole time with Jim Carrey. And his mind is going, this is going to, no one's going to watch this movie. And then it was like the biggest movie. Yes, I remember. The first one. I remember. Um, but anyway, so that's just why it's a very silly comedy that I just think is hysterical but the truman show is like one of my top like that that's you know i put those together because jim carrey but so so that was 96 i think i i I never saw the truman show but i think it's like really yeah it's like he like he's on it's a camera follows him does he know the camera is there uh no i mean i can't give it away but i'll tell you okay he he gets he gets suspicious let's put it that way okay i mean i i think i've seen bits and pieces and i'm sure listen if you didn't see that movie in '96 and you you've had 24 <clears throat> years to watch it, then uh, you can go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, um. No, it's you should see it though. It's just a it's an incredible movie. Yeah. The Truman Show, and then there was another one. I feel like there was one with like Matthew McConaughey that was kind of similar. Um, oh, Failure to Launch. No, I don't think that was it. It was something. I was else. joking. That's the one where he lives with his mom. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Is that? The <laughs> Do one? me a favor. When you edit this podcast, put that laugh right after when I say. <laughs> I mean, it was good. It's good. That's uh okay. Yeah, I don't know that one, but uh um, yeah. Okay, so I'll throw another one in. Here, here's one that uh you know one of my favorite movies of all time because I think John Cusack, it has one of the best filmographies. Um, he, he's, I, I would say for like twenty years, this guy's made the best fucking movies, and uh, one of them is Gross Point Blank. I think it's oh un- yeah. On like any time, I haven't seen it in so long, but I do remember that it was a great movie. But I haven't like re- I'd revisit it. You gotta like the soundtrack is amazing, and every time it's fucking on TV, I just put it on because it's so fucking good. It doesn't matter what yeah. what scene it's on. Like you know when you're like flipping through stuff and something is either in the beginning, the middle, or the end. It just doesn't yeah. matter. You put it on and it, it's so good. And it has yeah. Mini Driver, who had one of the best three picture runs. She had Sleepers, Goodwill Hunting, and fucking uh, this movie, Chris Point Blank. Mm. It's good shit. Yeah. Give me, give me something else. The third movie of your pile. Uh, no, this would be the fourth. Movie. Fourth, fourth, fourth. They Live. So good. 
I would say that is, so, is it, I, when I think in the movies that I, are like my favorite, there's so many, I could have told you a bunch of movies that I, I love equally. It was very hard to kind of do this, but I think of it as movies that I can just put on and leave on. Like or I could watch it in infinite amount, uh, an infinite amount of time still and, and not be bored of it. And that's one of them. Did you watch yeah. it as a kid? Um, I don't really think I found it until like the early, like 2000s. Okay. Like, like 2003. Before I don't, I was like, I was like, what is that? But you know what I mean? Like, came across it and I became obsessed with it. The, like, the, the poster is yeah. like iconic, like you, you know, and uh, just the imagery, you know. Um, I guess it was uh, John Carpenter's like response to like uh, Reagan is basically what he said. Um, yeah, so amazing. Um, if anyone doesn't know that movie, it's definitely worth seeing. It's very, very amazing. I just actually did a like I I took I took it from YouTube. There was a a scene where he in the beginning where he's putting on the glasses and like mm-hmm. you know you, you he's he's reading what the glasses you know it's like obey or whatever the fuck. So yeah, there was like a three and a half minute clip, and I just I, I took the lyrics to one of our songs and I just plastered it all over it. That's awesome. Yeah, and it worked. Uh, by the way, obey, he, obey, dude. He never got sued from John Carpenter for that one. That's the exact font and logo. Yes. Isn't that weird? Yes. Okay. Right. Nothing came of that, right? I don't think so. I, and I, I just feel like John. I feel like John's like a true artist, and like, uh, like, or a, can you, or can you copyright something like that in a movie, though? Maybe, maybe because it was just like typing on a thing. Like, can they say it wasn't like? Why would he think to copyright that? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. We would have to look that up for sure. But I, I think we just figured it out on the phone. Come over here. But <laughs> if only there was a search engine that we could look up these. Uh, yeah, if there was only, if only this conversation was happening in <laughs> 1999, and then we were wondering if there was ever going to be but a way to find out. They live fantastic. So um, yeah, I'll throw in another one. Um, another movie that I could watch over and over again is Clockers. I think Clockers is a movie that I never get a chance to mention on this show. So I'm I'm taking this opportunity to basically vent about how much I love it. I don't know if you've hmm. seen it. I don't. I heard of it, but I don't think I've seen it. No, I, or, or that I remember seeing it. So it's a Scorsese and like Spike Lee movie. Crime, drugs, cops, amazing cast like Harvey Keitel. I forgot who else. There's a, there's a whole bunch of people in it, but man, from like 1995, great soundtrack, Summer in the City, um, amazing direction. And uh, I could watch that shit over and over again. Which brings us to the fifth movie that you're going to tell me right now. And uh, yeah. this this is TJ's list. TJ's list of movies that he could put on at all times. So far you had 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, you had Blade Runner. You had Truman Show. And uh, They Live. So give me your last movie. All right. And this is one I, you know that I've always just had a you know a pretty big obsession with that i still carry tj does like, dallas it's tj does dallas <laughs> okay um no it's <laughs> intangible i wonder if anyone's gonna get that show um you can get it it's insatiable um okay <laughs> um so young frankenstein oh wow yeah that's my i i have to say that's like i don't that's like probably my favorite movie of all time how many times have you seen it? I have no idea. I've, I have no clue. I've seen it so many when, times. When did you first watch it? I feel like I watched it when I was like a kid with like my grandmother, and I and we I, I remember watching like Mel Brooks movies with my grandmother very vividly, like Blazing Saddles and stuff like that. So I think Young Frankenstein was just was such a iconic movie the whole time. You know, did I don't you, know why. Did you get all the jokes as like a kid? Probably not. I didn't get all the jokes on Martin when I was a kid. On Martin? I, I just wanted to throw in Martin. <laughs> yeah, I, just wanted, I was just like, what? I know. I just, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't know. I Probably not. I mean. No, but I'm saying know. like certain things like form your, like, you know, um, yeah, like I remember, I'll always remember watching Star Wars and uh, uh, I didn't understand the word cocky, right? Because so, I'm a yeah. kid. I'm thinking like cocky means cocky. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah duty like duty yeah like duty and like han solo you know like when they're shooting down the fucking tie fighters like uh um, luke is like i got another one i got another one and he's like don't get cocky kid and then he's he, going man don't don't 
I, poop in your pants. I didn't understand. So, like, me and my cousins were like, did he just say don't get cocky? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, we just thought it was like, don't get, yeah. don't get shit or something. Um, so yeah. As you get, you know, when you're young, like, certain things are above your head. And then as you watch them more, I guess you get them. So, it's, yeah. it's fun. You know, you, you watch something with your grandmother. I grew up with my grandparents. So, um, mm-hmm. things like that really stick out. And uh, even in, in uh, black and white movies, a kid didn't bother you. No, I mean, that's all, I, I guess not, no, no, really, because it was like, that was obviously the, the thing, the, the aesthetic of that movie was intentional, like, you knew it wasn't made at the time when it was supposed to be black and white, so they were doing it on purpose, Yeah. so I think, I don't know, I don't. I, don't, I never even thought about it, but that is, you couldn't even really, like, that's, that's the point of that movie, is that it's in black and white, you it's know? In black and white? Um, are, you, are, you, are you a fan of that movie? Yeah, I love I love all Mel Brooks stuff. You know, super funny guy. His son, amazing that his son grew up to to be. I think he's like an author primarily. Writes. Oh like yeah, yeah. World War Z. I didn't even know mm-hmm. that, and I was like, holy shit! I'm like, this is Mel Brooks's son. So that's yeah. So Young Frankenstein. That was the. Uh, that's always going to be my number one probably. I'll throw in one more. I'll just say dazing confused because I always say it. Oh, that's how I feel right now from that from that one. From days and days and confused. Wow, you of, of letting of letting that be the last movie after Young you Frankenstein. You don't no, like it? No, it's amazing. I'm just kidding. Okay, I'm just I, kidding. Listen, I don't know. It's something. I'm just kidding. It's one of those movies that doesn't. Uh, I, it's amazing how some movies just hit because it, nothing really happens during that movie. You're just hanging out for a day. You know. Yeah. You're just hanging. Like I do love McConaughey. I gotta say. Oh, he, yeah. He is just like that True Detective series. Oh, Ooh. amazing! And when he did Stern, you he said that that him in Dazing and Fuse that was his first scene when they roll up and he's like, "All right, all right, all right." And I yeah. don't, I don't know if you remember what the inspiration was that he said. Hold on, um, I I do remember the interview. I'm trying to, I mean, off the cuff, I guess I don't. It was like off off the cuff, off the cuff. <laughs> Shout out to Bobo. <laughs> oh, yeah, Bobo, you um, you bab- babbling moron. <laughs> Um. Oh, yeah. it was Jim, all right, all right, all right. Jim, Jim Morrison. Just, so it was the Doors. Oh, live, yeah. The Doors live album. And uh, he I just, got that. He was like, "Holy shit!" He's like, "I'm about to do my first scene." He's like, "I don't know." He's like, and then he said he channeled Jim Morrison, and and on that album, the live Doors album, he said, "All right, all right, all right." And then he pulls in, and that's the first thing you see when he talks to that redhead. So crazy. That is my favorite scene because he chumps off those two dudes in the car. Yeah, so bad that he doesn't even acknowledge them. He's trying to like bang the girl in the car, and then at the end of it, he goes, "So, do you need a ride?" <laughs> <laughs> and like she's driving, and he's still like, <laughs> it, "I think that's like the ultimate like snatching your lunch type shit, man." Like, like that's that's some alpha male shit that's so funny to watch. I love it. Yeah, that is a good move. Cool, man. So we're gonna play these people at the end of this episode. In a cool. second, and uh, cool. Thanks for chatting with me and hanging out with me on this. Uh, I don't know what's today, Monday. Uh, it is Monday. Thank you. All right, buddy. I've got an idea. I think.